A man accused of impersonating an undercover police officer and then sexually assaulting a woman decided to serve as his own lawyer. That meant that the alleged rape victim was in the witness stand face to face with the man she feared. Andrea Canning has more. So your testimony here today now is that you were raped. I was raped by you. You forced sex upon me. For more than two hours Tuesday, Lewis Harris came face to face with a woman he's accused of sexually assaulting. Do you remember testifying earlier that you pulled over because you thought you may have hit something? I testified that you were flagging me down. But instead of listening from the defendant's table, Harris was the one asking the questions, representing himself. Can you describe me, my height, my size, my build? You're a tan Hispanic male, short haircut. You're taller than me. So I'd say maybe six foot. Must have grown a foot or so. The woman, who we're not identifying, says last summer Harris flashed a blue light in her car window and told her he was an undercover police officer. When I exited my vehicle out of the park, you handcuffed me. Harris is accused of putting the woman in his car and driving her to an ATM where he's seen on surveillance withdrawing money. He then allegedly assaulted her. But he says the two had drinks in a bar before having consensual sex. I'm not a monster. I'm just a regular individual person just like anybody here. I'm accused of some pretty harsh allegations. At no time did I identify myself as a law enforcement officer. Harris, who has no legal training, was repeatedly scolded by the judge. I'm going to answer your question. I don't have to answer that question. The answer is no. But Harris fired right back. Not a dog that you need to bark orders at. Harris now says representing himself was a, quote, tremendous error in judgment. For Good Morning America, Andrea Canning, ABC News. And joining me now is Janine Pirro, host of the Judge Pirro Show and the new Fox program, Justice with Judge Janine. I've never seen anything like this before. Does it happen that often? It is very rare, George, that you have someone who's accused of rape in a position of actually questioning in the face of the rape victim. And I have to tell you that the DA in me is outraged at the horrific situation where there's an opportunity to kind of replay the horrific psychological uh, damage that occurs to victims of rape. But the judge in me says, wait a minute, there is a Sixth Amendment constitutional right of confrontation. And so you've got the intersection of these two issues. And it is unusual. It is clearly a deterrent to rape victims. Rape is the most underreported crime in America. And for a victim to think that she has to not just recite, but relive the actual crime with the person who inflicted this act upon her is uh, I think the, the most and, the biggest deterrent that and, you can and treat, have and treat the suspect with a measure of respect just by the by the being in that courtroom. How does it affect how a witness might testify? I think if you think about it, George, that the witness is clearly lost going back in the moment in time. You know, the damage is emotional, it's psychological, in addition to it physical as well. But this puts her in a position of not being able to extricate herself from it, putting closure on it. She now has another nightmare that she has to relive. And it's really up to the judge to set parameters to make sure that he's not imposing. And in this particular case, you heard the judge say, you can't badger her. You can't wait two to three minutes between each question. Searching for your question. Searching for a question, not just in terms of judicial administration and economy in terms of time, but in terms of putting the victim basically in limbo. So this is a nightmare. There are victims who've tried to kill themselves, who've collapsed after taking the stand. But make no mistake, this is legal, it is constitutional, and it is an unfortunate situation. The judge has been pretty tough. Uh, on the suspect there. In fact, he denied the suspect's um, attempt to get a mistrial. After the guy defended himself, he realized, I'm not doing a very good job. I want to bring the lawyers back. And some people thought that was a deliberate strategy to get a mistrial? Absolutely. It was calculated because now he gets to question her again through his attorney. And think about it, George. Why would anybody who is not a skilled attorney and cross-examiner put himself in the position of risking a guilty verdict just because because he wants to assert his dominance over the victim in another setting. We know the predators like to relive their sex crimes. This gives him the opportunity, assuming, and of course he's presumed innocent, it gives him the opportunity to relive his moment with the victim again. But the judge said no do-overs. What's your gut on how a jury responds to something like this? 
You know, initially I thought, well, you know, he gets to stand up before the jury as opposed to just sitting there and being quiet, and they may see him as a regular guy. But juries, and I know this from 30 years, they are savvy, they are smart, they feel that that additional layer of what's going on in terms of interpersonal reaction. Juries get it. I don't think that uh, this will benefit him at all. Okay, Judge Piro, thanks very much.